Yo, yo, I'm Yovan Buha, Lakers beat writer for The Athletic, and welcome to another Lakers postgame reaction show. I just got back from the Smoothie King Center where the Lakers beat the New Orleans Pelicans 124 to 108 to conclude the regular season as the number eight seed. They finish 47 and 35, and they will stay in New Orleans to play the Pelicans in the 7 8 game on Tuesday. If the Lakers win that game, they are the seven seed and will face the Denver Nuggets in a Western Conference Finals rematch in the first round. If they lose that game, they will head back to LA to host either the number nine Sacramento Kings or the number 10 Golden State Warriors on Friday in a game that will determine the eight seed. And then that team would go to Oklahoma City who earned the number one seed. This was a dominant two-way performance by the Lakers. They led by as many as 32 points. They were shooting over 60% for most of the first three quarters. They held the Pelicans to about 43% shooting through the first three quarters. Another impressive Lakers performance in a big game. This wasn't technically a play-in game, but LA is 2-0 in the play-in era, and they went 7-0 in the in-season tournament. So their track record in the regular season in must-win games in the LeBron AD era is pretty remarkable. And they continued that tonight. They won the season series with the Pelicans 3-1, with all three wins being blowouts. And I think this was such a convincing win that when coupled with winning the season series in the manner that they did and the last couple of matchups being Laker blowouts, that the Lakers have a bit of a psychological edge over the Pelicans. And I think it's just a bad matchup for the Pelicans, as I covered on Friday's episode of Buha's Block. With that said, it is tough to win two consecutive games on the road in the same place. Uh, we saw earlier in the season, Lakers had that split in San Antonio. And it's just, it's tough to do. Going back to the last postseason, remember, they won game one in Memphis, lost game two in Memphis, uh, won game one in Golden State, lost game two in Golden State. Uh, so it, it's just, it's hard to go on the road and win two consecutive games in the same building. Of course, I think the Lakers can do it. I think they will do it. But it is going to be a challenge, and I think it is going to be a closer game uh, that could come down to the final few minutes or even final few possessions, depending on how New Orleans adjusts. If you can't tell, I'm a little stuffy. I'm under the weather, uh, so bear with me. I'm trying to get through this one as normal as possible. But you guys know the drill. We are going to touch on the box score numbers from tonight's game and then get into our three takeaways. LeBron James set the tone on both ends with his fifth triple-double of the season. He had 28 points, 11 rebounds, and 17 assists. Also had five steals, though, was very active in the passing lanes, igniting the Lakers' fast breaks, and just being generally disruptive uh, to New Orleans' offense. He was setting the table early with eight assists in the first eight minutes. Uh, Austin Reeves had a line in his postgame press conference where he was like, I looked up at the scoreboard during the early part of the second quarter, and I saw 11 in the assist category for LeBron. And I thought it was a typo. I didn't think that was possible. LeBron posted a career-high 13 assists in the first half, finished with a season-high 17 assists overall. Anthony Davis had 30 points, including 14 in the first quarter. He basically played Jonas Valanciunas off the floor. Uh, Valanciunas got benched three minutes into the game, didn't return until early in the fourth quarter, ended up only playing seven minutes, uh, largely due to the Lakers attacking him and pick and rolls, and Davis just getting by him, getting to the rim. AD added 11 rebounds. There was an injury scare, though. AD exited at the 522 mark of the fourth quarter. Uh, so Gabe Vincent goes up for a layup. He misses it, which AD jokingly said after the game, uh, you know, this is all Gabe Vincent's fault for, for missing that layup. But AD goes up for a, an offensive rebound, and Larry Nance Jr. Uh, pushes him in the back, and it triggers back spasms for AD. So he's spazzing up, doesn't get back on defense on the next possession. And at the next dead ball, uh, he checks out. He's walking gingerly to the scorer's table, doesn't even make it to the Lakers bench, uh, crouches over, Lakers call timeout. And then they start stretching out his right leg. Uh, but he told us after the game that there's no way he's not going to play on Tuesday. So that is a positive sign. Uh, Darvin Ham said he's extremely optimistic. AD will be available on Tuesday. So you're hearing it from a couple of important sources there. Uh, so all signs point toward AD being available on Tuesday. But this is something to monitor. Back spasms are tricky. They can flare up. And AD has already dealt with some hip and groin issues this season. So that general area is all kind of connected uh, to an extent. So this is just something to keep an eye on uh, in terms of how AD is moving, if, if this limits him at all, and if this gets re-aggravated, potentially uh, playing through contact, playing in the paint as AD does. D'Angelo Russell shook out of his shooting slump with 19 points 
and four assists. He made five threes, including several that helped the Lakers extend their lead uh, in key moments where the offense was struggling a bit. So a solid bounce back performance from D'Lo. The Lakers were plus 26 in his 38 minutes, which was a team best mark. Austin Reeves had 20 points and Rui had 11 points, seven rebounds and four assists, including an impressive behind the back pass to AD that AD got fouled on. One of the best passes I've ever seen Rui make, if not the best pass. Uh, but Rui was killing the Pelicans with back cuts along the baseline and exposing their smaller help defenders. The bench was relatively quiet, but when four of the five starters go for 19 plus, uh, that tends to be the case. Torian Prince had nine points, came in and made an offensive impact. Spencer Dinwiddie had seven, and we saw the Lakers tighten up the rotation a bit, lean more on the starters, lean more on Rui Hachimura. He played the whole first quarter, and LA tried to maintain some size, which is, I think, the path moving forward. No more Torian at the four minutes. No more playing three guards next to Torian at the four. If you're going to play three guards, you need Rui, AD, LeBron, or Jackson, some combination of those four guys on the floor next to those three guards. But the rotation got a little bit tighter, only 14 minutes for Spencer, 13 for Gabe, and 12 for Jackson. So we're starting to see what the Lakers playoff rotation could look like depending on the matchup and, and who's playing well and whatnot. But it's going to be eight or nine guys, and we know who those guys are. LA ended up winning the free throw battle, but they had three free throws uh, into the third quarter. They made 17 of their 18, 94.4%. Uh, but they didn't really start to rack those up until the third and fourth quarter. They built a huge lead. I think it might have even been into late into the third that they only had three free throws. Uh, and then that started to, again, build up uh, as the game went on. But they held the Pelicans to only 14 free throw attempts. They had 12 steals. Pelicans had 19 turnovers. LA made 11 to 29 threes, 38%. Uh, Pelicans made 15 of 37, 41%. Pelicans never led in this game. LA led the entire time. And fast break points was 19 to 15 in LA's favor. Second chance points was 11 to 8 in LA's favor. And points in the paint, 68 to 42. And New Orleans is one of the best points in the paint teams in the league. And the fact that LA dominated that category that emphatically shows exactly why, in my opinion, this is just not a good matchup for the Pelicans. They are too small. For the Lakers, they don't have a great matchup for AD. Jonas Valanciunas is too slow. Uh, Larry Nance Jr. is too small and not strong enough. No one can guard LeBron. Zion is too slow. Uh, Larry Nance is guarding AD. Uh, and Herb Jones, Trey Murphy the third, Brandon Ingram, all those guys are just too skinny to guard LeBron. So LeBron did whatever he wanted. And if they were doubling him, blitzing, uh, setting multiple bodies in the paint, that's where he's finding cutters. Uh, finding AD for lobs, finding shooters. So uh, the Pelicans just don't have a great answer for LeBron and AD. And that's why I think the Lakers should win on Tuesday. All right, so takeaway number one is simple. And it's LeBron James, who continues to deliver in big moments for this team. His performances in the in-season tournament, specifically that New Orleans game where he hit that barrage of threes to put them away in the second quarter. And we obviously know this by now with LeBron. His track record speaks for itself. But to continue to do this in year 21, to be able to rise to the occasion in the manner that he did, I mean, this was one of his best performances of the season. And this was when the Lakers needed him the most. But setting the tone the way he did early, getting his teammates involved, and getting New Orleans to have to respect everyone on the floor at all times uh, eventually opened up things for LeBron to have a much bigger second half. Now, technically, his first half and second half scoring splits were pretty similar, 13 in the first half, 15 in the second half, but just felt like he was more aggressive in the second half, attacking the rim, getting downhill, and just maintaining the Lakers' cushion, maintaining their rhythm. And there were some times in the third quarter, I don't love when the Lakers start to just roll the ball up the floor to kill time. Uh, I'm, I also think it's an offensive foul when the guy in front of the, the ball handler is just like using, like setting a moving screen and using their arms. It never gets called for some reason. Uh, so I guess it, it works from that regard. But I, I do think it takes them out of their rhythm. And, and there were times in the, the third quarter where the defense slipped up. There were some turnovers. I, I didn't love how the offense was stalling out. But ultimately, this was an elite two-way performance from LeBron. He locked up Zion uh, for the second time this season. Uh, Zion finished four for 13, looked very timid, 
looked very similar to the in-season tournament matchup where he was second guessing uh it just did not want to drive against lebron and into ad those guys were doing a, a good job contesting him and forcing him into tough shots and even at times when uh it was like Rui on him or uh austin switch on to him like he, he was not getting high percentage looks uh, the way that he does against other teams. So a lot of the credit goes to LeBron and, and taking on that assignment. And Zion still had eight assists and, and he was finding shooters. And one thing that I think they need to clean up is, is the helping off, uh, you know, one pass away with, with plus shooters. And they did that several times in the first half. I think that could come back to bite them either in the play-in game or if they lose that game and then the next play in game or, or in the first round, whatever, uh, like I think they, they got to shore that up in terms of like there are certain times you don't help off a shooter and the one pass away one um, uh, like they were kind of going under Herb Jones, and letting him shoot. Uh, he finished four or seven on threes and several of those were wide open. And I just think that's not a smart defensive strategy. But LeBron took on the Zion assignment. He did a great job. And I don't know if you can rely on that every single night for a guy in year 21, age 39. But if you can, that raises the Lakers defensive ceiling because LeBron at times has been the weak link in their defense, uh, specifically just because he's the low man. He's the guy rotating. And if he's not on time and, and in sync with the rest of the defense, uh, that's where you see guys blow by the perimeter guys and then they get to the rim and finish or they get an offensive rebounds or or he'll preemptively rotate. And then there's no one filling in because guys aren't on the same page so LeBron can be the quarterback of the defense sometimes like obviously AD is the captain and, and he's one of the best rim protectors in the league one of the best defenders in the league and ultimately the Lakers need a certain level of defense from him every night which they pretty much get uh, but LeBron can be an x-factor defensively for this group and when he's locked in like this uh, it just really elevates their ceiling on both ends because then it leads to run outs and uh, Lakers getting stops leads to better offense. So I, I just think this was a surgical performance by LeBron, particularly with the passing and finding the weak spots in New Orleans defense. And this is a nice reminder of why I and others have said the Lakers can go on a run this postseason because if you're getting this version of LeBron, he's going to be the best player on the floor in a lot of games. And when he's playing like that, the Lakers have a chance against basically anybody. Takeaway number two is this was a return to form for LA. And I think that's important in must-win scenarios in the play-in and if they get there, the playoffs. Because looking at the last few games, LA had the Minnesota game where LeBron didn't play. AD gets injured after the first quarter. Then they had the Golden State game where AD doesn't play. LeBron plays through the flu, uh, but they lose both of those games. Then they go to Memphis and basically play a G League team, and that game goes down to the final seconds. And there's some ugly basketball, uh, some of the worst turnovers in, in recent weeks, some of their worst defense in recent weeks. And as Darvin Ham said after the game, it left a sour taste in the players' mouths. And it was something that the team talked about in their film session yesterday uh, at the team hotel. Uh, like they were upset with how they played in that Memphis game. And they came out and responded well against New Orleans. And they started resembling the team that was playing so well leading up to last weekend before LeBron got sick and AD got poked in the eye. And they lost some of that rhythm and that flow and that momentum. So uh, this was a nice bounce back performance, a bounce back performance in a big game, in a uh, critical moment for their season had the Lakers lost. They would have been the number 10 seed because both the Kings and the Warriors won. So they'd be the number 10 going to the number nine Warriors uh, for a game on Tuesday. And that would have been a single elimination game with their season on the line. And had they won that game, they would have then played the loser of the number seven, eight game, which in that scenario would have been the seven Suns versus the number eight Kings. Uh, Pelicans would have had one more win than the Suns, so they would have been the six. Suns would have been the seven. But that is a much tougher path, having to win in Golden State and then going to play either the Suns or the Kings on the road. This path is you stay in New Orleans. That's basically an extended road trip in the same city. You play them again on Tuesday, confident, coming off of uh, Sunday's win. Then if you win, you get Denver, which isn't great, uh, but I will touch on that in, in my next takeaway. And then if you lose, you go home Friday, to host either the Kings or the Warriors in a single elimination must win for the, the number eight seed. But but one of the themes of tonight's show is LA's ability to flip a switch in big games. It hasn't always been the case. They did lose to the Kings twice uh, last month. They did lose to Denver twice over the past couple months in, in big games. So it's not like th there are some teams that are bad matchups for them. 
I don't count the Golden State game where, where AD left early or this last one, uh, despite both being big games. Uh, so if, if AD or LeBron was injured, I'm, I'm not going to count that at, uh, against the Lakers. But in terms of like you know, must-win scenarios that they've been in, for the most part, they've been able to rise to the occasion. And again, there have been some hiccups, but it's specifically been Sacramento and Denver. But Sacramento, they might not face. And if they do, it would be in the play-in scenario. Uh, though no Malik Monk, no Kevin Herter. And then Denver is Denver, and, and that's going to be a tough one. But again, I will touch on that. Uh, in my next takeaway. So big picture, LA has won 11 of 14. Uh, two of those losses, AD only played one quarter in. Uh, LeBron missed one of those losses. And then the other loss is that Indiana game, which they had one of their worst shooting performances of the season in terms of both field goal percentage and three-point percentage. Just an off night all around for them energetically and execution-wise. But that stinker aside, the Lakers have been playing really high-level basketball when healthy, the one healthy caveat obviously always applies to, to this team. And the AD scare is a nice reminder that health can be fleeting in the NBA, especially with this team. LeBron and AD have managed to be relatively healthy for the most part, but something could always be around the corner. So that's that's the one concern really moving forward uh, in addition to potentially playing Denver. But even with that said, LA has won 11 of 14. Uh, they are 18 and six with this starting lineup. And they're playing really good basketball at the right time of the season for the second straight season. And finally, takeaway number three is the 7-8 game is a win-win for LA. Now, let me explain. Uh, so if they win the game, they make the playoffs as the number seven seed and they face the Denver Nuggets. And I'm going to be honest, I think the Nuggets will win that series. I think the Nuggets will win that series rather easily. My tentative pick would be Nuggets in five. I just think it's a bad matchup for LA. Though they have played the Nuggets close uh, last year and this year, Denver has won seven straight games. They have a certain level of confidence and a psychological edge over the Lakers. Uh, Lakers internally have acknowledged how difficult the Denver matchup is for them. And while I think LA could get a game and maybe even two, maybe they push it to six, Denver's just at a different level from an execution standpoint and, and specifically a two-way execution standpoint. Like I think similar to the last matchup, LA's offense can hang with Denver's offense and you saw that in that game. But when it came down to crunch time and LA's offense gummed up, Denver locked in. LA not only did not have an answer offensively for Denver and, and wasn't making the big shots or, or the big plays, but Denver made all the big plays as they tend to do against the Lakers. There's just something about the purple and gold that bring out the best in the Denver Nuggets. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you guys. Like I, I think Denver would win that series pretty easily. Uh, and maybe it's a close five game series, but like, I, I think Denver would beat the Lakers. So that is a concern with winning on Tuesday. However, you do lock in a playoff position and once you're in the playoffs, anything could happen. Maybe the Lakers are the one with a scorching shooting series uh, like Denver had in the conference finals. Uh, maybe someone on Denver goes down. Maybe a key starter goes down. And all of a sudden, they're relying on their bench more. And their bench, they, you know, that's one of the weaknesses of the roster, that they're not very deep. And that starting lineup is a machine with everyone having their roles and their parts. And if you take out one of those cogs, uh, especially depending on who it is, like it, it's tough to replace. Like, they don't have another MPJ on the team. They don't have another Aaron Gordon on the team. They don't have another KCP on the team. Like, Peyton Watson, Christian Brown, like, those guys can step up. But uh, it's it's a tall ask to replace those three. And obviously, Murray and, and Jokic, it goes without saying uh, how dominant those guys are and, and how irreplaceable they are. But the one positive to winning is you lock in a playoff seed. You get some rest entering game one. Uh, all of a sudden, you can start to prepare for Denver and get there Friday for, I, I believe, the game would be on Sunday and get to prepare for for several days for that matchup uh, now if you lose the upside is you avoid denver and you play at home for the second playing game on friday and then you would play on sunday uh, but you'd be playing okc who the lakers are very confident against and then it also pits you on the side of the bracket of playing dallas or the clippers in round two which i think is a tougher matchup honestly than playing minnesota in round two I've been vocal on here. I'm, I'm not a big believer in Minnesota, uh, but that could also be playing Phoenix in round two if Phoenix beats Minnesota in the 3-6 matchup. So uh, depending on how you look at it, I would probably put Phoenix on a similar level to Dallas or the Clippers. I know that might be a slightly controversial take. Some Most people would probably have the Clippers and Mavericks ahead of them. Uh, I think it's, it's similar. So Lakers could be facing a similar second round opponent in either instance if they do advance, but 
I give them a much higher odds of advancing as the number eight seed uh, against the Thunder. Just the risk of losing uh, against the Pelicans is now you're in a single game uh, elimination setting and another hot shooting performance from the Warriors, maybe not 26 threes, but 16 threes or 18 threes or 20 threes. Like that's within the realm of possibility for a group like that. Uh, Or DeMontis Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox do what they've done all season against the Lakers and just demolish them. And Keon Ellis, uh, who's filled in nicely for Malik Monk uh, as a three and D guard, you know, he plays well and and Kings now have Trey Lyles back. And like, so, I mean, the the Kings like on paper are the easiest matchup in the West that they are the team. I I would, you know, I I think the Warriors are going to beat them in the nine ten. but even then, like they've had the Lakers number and you you just don't want to be in that scenario where it's essentially a game seven. uh, and, And if you lose your season's over, and the momentum that you we just talked about in the last takeaway of winning 11 to 14, getting up to the number eight spot. Uh, now, all of a sudden, you lose to New Orleans, you lose to Golden State or Sacramento. It's a really bad way to end the season, a really disappointing end to the season for the Lakers, not even making the playoffs uh, in that uh, scenario. So if you're the Lakers and like you could control it, I would say be the eight seed and, and play the Thunder and, and go on that path. I think I would pick them over OKC in about six games. But... Denver's the Denver's the one team like no one and it's not even just a Lakers thing like no one wants to play Denver in round one like they're the heavy favorites to come out of the Western Conference and I know there's the argument of playing them earlier catching them uh, earlier while you're fresher while you can play LeBron and AD 42 44 minutes uh, I understand that I still just don't think it matters in this matchup I don't know that the Lakers know their five best players against the Nuggets I'm not convinced it's D'Angelo Russell I don't know who he defends in that closing group uh, in the last five to seven minutes of games? Is it Spencer Dinwiddie? Is it Gabe Vincent? I don't think it's Torian Prince either. There's just a lot of unknown elements with a potential Denver matchup and and really some known elements of the Lakers' inability to stop the Jokic-Murray two-man game. Michael Porter killing them. Uh, Aaron Gordon killing them with offensive rebounds and cuts for for lobs and and uh, dives and and seals and like KCP just running around uh, off screens and, and pin downs and uh, you know uh, hitting jumpers and it's just like we we've seen that movie before so many times that and who knows maybe I'm wrong that would be fun if the Lakers pulled off that upset and the season continued and and I get to continue covering games and and doing these post game reaction shows with you guys but I try to be real and honest with you guys and I think. My honest opinion is Denver would win in five against the Lakers. I think L.A. gets one of the ones uh, in L.A. And again, maybe it's a close five-game series, but a five-game series is still a five-game series, and it's still the Lakers losing in round one. Uh, So Denver was the one. Like There was a a moment where it looked like they might be the three seed, depending on what happened with Minnesota. Minnesota ends up losing to Phoenix. They end up dropping to three. And I I think that's a bad outcome for Minnesota as well because they just lost to Phoenix, and now they're about to play them in a seven-game series. And Again, I'm going to pick Phoenix to win that series. So there's still a lot of moving parts in the West and in the playoff picture, a lot to be determined. Uh, but the Lakers, in my opinion, again, are in a win-win where if you win, you are guaranteed a playoff spot, though it is against the Nuggets. If you lose, you get a second chance and a second chance at home uh, where the Lakers have been dominant. And they should be solid favorites in that matchup against either the Kings or the Warriors. Then they would get in as the eight seed against the Thunder, which is the prime matchup the Lakers have been wanting. So we shall see, but that'll do it for tonight's episode. Thank you so much for watching and listening. For those on YouTube, please consider subscribing, hitting that notification bell, liking and commenting. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, your podcast platform of choice, please consider following, downloading, and leaving a five-star review. I'll be back on Monday with episode 13 of Buha's Block. I will be previewing the Pelicans matchup. I'm going to go over the film from game one and come back with some questions and some adjustments for both sides and just talk out how I think the matchup will go on Tuesday. Playoff previews are my favorite thing to do. I love diving into both team strategy and questions and and just sort of the the X factors and, and the key matchups. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you again for watching and listening, and I'll talk to you soon.